Chapter 8 Nicole stood in the quiet of the gallery, her gaze lingering on the collection of vivid oil paintings that adorned the otherwise stark walls. Each stroke of color was a secret testament to Theodore's hidden talent, a royal who hid his art from the world. Wouldn't it be something, Nicole mused to herself, if you were here, Theo, standing right beside your masterpieces? She envisioned him there, his eyes alight with the pride he was too humble to show publicly. Nicole cherished these moments before the exhibit opened when the art whispered its stories to her alone. As if conjured by her thoughts, a rhythmic knocking broke the silence, pulling Nicole from her reverie. Her heart skipped, hope threading through her veins as she moved toward the entrance. No one was expected at this hour. The thought that it might be him sent a surge of adrenaline coursing through her. With a hand that trembled ever so slightly, Nicole unbolted the door and swung it open. There, framed by the golden light of dusk, stood Theodore. His presence was as unexpected as it was thrilling, casting a long shadow that stretched into the gallery like an extension of himself. Theo? The name slipped out, her voice betraying a mixture of astonishment and affection. What are you doing here? His lips curved into a tentative smile, one that reached his eyes. I couldn't stay away, he admitted. I needed to see the fruits of our labor, our collaboration. Us? Nicole echoed, her surprise slowly morphing into a warmth that spread across her cheeks. Of course. He stepped over the threshold. We worked so hard on this. It's ours. Is it? she asked, her tone gentle, but probing. Because I'm not sure I know what us means anymore, Theodore. Not after everything. Nicole, he breathed, stepping closer. His hand lifted as if to touch her, then hesitated. I've been a fool, but my feelings for you, they're the one truth in all this mess. Could she reconcile the man she knew with the prince who had lied? His art spoke of a soul laid bare, yet it was his honesty she craved now more than ever. Your truths have layers, Theo, she replied, her voice a soft echo in the room filled with his unspoken dreams. And I'm just beginning to peel them back. A myriad of emotions danced in Nicole's chest as she regarded him, standing there, a man she thought she knew inside out. Nicole, he began, I cannot, and will not, pretend that what we have can be simply brushed aside. He stepped into the room. And yet, for your safety, we must conceal this, whatever this is between us. Her heart quickened at his words, and her mind raced with questions. Safety? Concealment? The art around them whispered secrets, but none as profound as the one he was urging her to keep. Secrets are dangerous, Theo, she whispered back, her gaze locked on his. They have a way of growing, festering. Then let it fester out of sight, away from those who would harm you because of me. His eyes burned with an intensity that made her shiver. For now, at least. Please. Nicole felt the gravity of his plea pulling at her resolve. Her skin prickled as his fingertips brushed hers, an electric charge of connection that spoke louder than words. Can I trust you, Theodore? Trust me when I say I've never wanted anything, or anyone, as much as I want you. His voice cracked with the raw edge of truth. The air stilled as they stood inches apart, the space between them charged with unsaid promises and unshed tears. Then, as if drawn by a force greater than themselves, their bodies moved together. Their lips met softly at first, a tentative exploration that bloomed into a kiss steeped in longing and laced with passion. Nicole closed her eyes, allowing herself to sink into the moment, into the sweet pressure of Theodore's mouth against hers. She could taste the salt of his skin, feel the heat of his breath, and the gentle caress of his hands as they found their way to her waist. As they parted, breathless, the echo of their union lingered in the air, a silent testament to the depth of their connection. Nicole rested her forehead against Theodore's, her mind a whirlwind of emotion. Her voice was barely audible as she confided in him, I'm scared, Theodore. Me too, he admitted. 
but I'd rather face that fear with you than without you. In the quiet aftermath of their kiss, the shadows of doubt still lurked at the edges of Nicole's thoughts. Yet, as she gazed into Theodore's eyes, she realized that her heart had already cast its vote. Her breath hitched, caught between the desire to believe him and the fear of him leaving again. How can I trust anything now? Because I'm here, he pressed, his thumb gently caressing the back of her hand. I'm risking everything to be here with you. Doesn't that count for something? Nicole searched his face, seeking the truth amid the shadows that played across his features. She found it in the slight tremble of his lip, the earnestness that shone in his eyes. It was enough to tip the scales, enough to make her want to leap into the unknown once more. Okay, she finally breathed. We'll do this your way. In secret. Thank you, Theodore's relief was palpable. And Nicole? He leaned in, his voice a velvet whisper. You have my word, I won't miss the opening. No matter what it takes. Your word, she echoed, a fragile hope taking root. It was a beginning, albeit one shrouded in mystery and danger. But as she looked into Theodore's eyes, she realized that even amidst deception and betrayal, there remained a thread of something genuine, something worth fighting for. With a resolved nod, she stepped back into his embrace, allowing herself to be enveloped by the promise of a clandestine courtship. For now, the unanswered questions could wait. Nicole, Theodore leaned forward, his eyes sharp with intrigue. These meetings, could you describe the man? Anything distinctive about him? She met Theodore's intense gaze. Distinguished, silver hair, and his hands. They always fidgeted with a gold signet ring, a crest I couldn't quite place. Signet rings are often familial, Theodore interjected, his mind racing through the lineage of nobles. Nicole, do you think you could sketch the crest? Maybe, she hesitated. I'll need to concentrate. She reached for her purse and the pencil and paper she kept there. Take your time, he encouraged. As she sketched, Theodore watched over her shoulder. Here, Nicole finally said. Oh well, Theodore murmured. The crest belonged to a lineage thought loyal, an allegiance woven into the very fabric of the kingdom. Is it familiar? Nicole asked. It is, Theodore affirmed, his hand involuntarily clenching into a fist. It's the insignia of the House of Bellamy. Would they have reason to conspire with Christopher? Until now, I would have thought not. Theodore's gaze turned distant as he thought about all the places he'd seen the family in question. But desperation breeds strange alliances. Then we must be careful, Nicole said softly. We'll unravel this plot thread by thread. Indeed, Theodore agreed. And shield James from those who want to harm him. Asterisk. The following day, Nicole's fingers danced across the cool ivory of her telephone. She asked questions that on the surface meant nothing, but underneath would explain so much. Mr. Henderson, how lovely to hear your voice, Nicole said. I was just reminiscing about the lovely Van Gogh you admired last week. By the way, have you seen Marquis Christopher lately? He mentioned an acquisition that piqued my interest. Each conversation she had with her patrons was a piece of the puzzle, and Nicole felt the image of conspiracy slowly materializing before her mind's eye. Later, in the back room of the gallery, Theodore and Nicole met to exchange information. Any word from the Countess? Theodore asked. Nothing concrete, Nicole replied. But she hinted at a gathering, somewhere private. Interesting, he mused. We must find out more. As the days passed, each telephone call Nicole made gathered more pieces of the puzzle that lay before them. Christopher was quite taken with the Rembrandt, you say? She probed. I wonder what draws him to such somber pieces. Perhaps it mirrors something within him, Theodore suggested later, their shadows merging as they leaned close in the dimness of the back room. A darkness we've yet to uncover or a clue to his intentions, Nicole countered. 
Tell me everything, he insisted, his gaze intense, searching hers for secrets she had yet to divulge. Patience, she said softly. We mustn't rush or we risk alerting him. Here, Nicole said, her finger tracing the intricate pattern etched into the margin of an old auction catalog. Do you see it? The symbol matches the one on Christopher's seal. It does. Perhaps Christopher's family is selling off their heirlooms because of money trouble? There have been no rumors, but not all rumors reach the ears of the royal family. We need to work faster. Our country won't be happy for long without James making his presence known. Your father may be king, but James is the face of the monarchy. You're right, Theodore agreed. We must act quickly. Friday, Nicole proposed. Friday, I'll host a private viewing at the gallery. It will allow us to observe Christopher, I'll invite him personally, and perhaps we'll hear something. We can't reveal our hand too soon. We have to have unarguable proof. Theodore's hand found hers. Caution is my middle name, she replied. Then until tomorrow, he said. Until tomorrow, she echoed. Asterisk. Anything? Theodore's voice was low as he watched her go through a pile of envelopes. Nothing but invitations and thank you notes. Nicole felt her frustration mounting. It's as if. A sudden rustle of paper drew their attention to the far corner of the room. A single envelope had slipped from a pile unnoticed until now. It bore no seal, no mark, just a plain, unassuming surface. Here, Nicole said, her heart skipping a beat. She carefully opened the envelope, withdrawing the single sheet within. The message was brief, a mere few lines scrawled in a hasty hand. Meet at the stroke of midnight, where history sleeps and secrets keep. Could this be it? Her voice quivered with a cocktail of hope and trepidation. Perhaps, Theodore mused, his brow furrowed. But it's too vague. Where history sleeps could be any number of places in this city steeped in the past. Then we must consider secrets keep. Nicole's mind raced, her thoughts spinning. Could it refer to the royal archives? Or somewhere more clandestine? Let us not rush to action, Theodore cautioned, laying a hand on her arm. This could very well be a trap laid by Christopher to ensnare us. They were so close, yet the fear of a misstep loomed over them like a specter, threatening to undo all they had worked for. Then we'll set our own trap, Nicole said with newfound resolve. We'll watch and wait. If Christopher appears, we follow. If not, we've lost nothing. Agreed. Theodore stepped back, allowing her the space to think. His trust in her was a balm to the sting of uncertainty. They spent the remaining hours before midnight in silence, each lost in their thoughts. When the time came, Nicole and Theodore took their positions, hidden in the shadows of the grand hallway that led to the archives. Their breaths were shallow, their bodies taut with anticipation. And then, the unexpected occurred. Nicole. Theodore's grip on her arm was sudden and firm. Look. At the end of the corridor, a figure emerged, a man they both recognized, but not Christopher. It was the older gentleman who frequented Nicole's gallery. Is he? Nicole's question hung in the air, unfinished. An assassin? An ally? Theodore's words were laced with disbelief. Or something else entirely? Go get it, Theodore said. Nicole darted forward, her hands shaking, as she retrieved the package. Inside, they found not a message, but an object, a tiny, intricately carved chess piece in the shape of a bishop. Christopher's playing games, Nicole murmured, a chill running down her spine. Or sending a warning, Theodore added grimly. Checkmate, a voice echoed from the darkness, chillingly familiar. Nicole's blood turned to ice. Theodore drew her back, shielding her with his body as they faced the silhouette that materialized from the shadows. Marquis Christopher, Theodore acknowledged, his tone betraying no fear. 
who else? The Marquis replied, his face obscured by the dim light. I'm impressed by your little charade, but you're playing in a game far beyond your comprehension. Then enlighten us, Nicole challenged. Alas, I'm not one to reveal my strategies prematurely. Christopher's voice was smooth as silk. But rest assured, the next move will be mine. With those words, he vanished as swiftly as he had appeared, leaving them in the suffocating silence of the corridor. Nicole's heart pounded relentlessly. Theodore's gaze met hers, a silent vow passing between them. Whatever game Christopher thinks he's playing, Nicole said, we'll be ready for him. As they retreated into the safety of the library, neither noticed the faint glimmer of light reflecting off the lens of a camera tucked away in the shadows, a lens that captured their every move, broadcasting it to an unseen observer whose intentions remained shrouded in mystery. Chapter 10 Nicole rubbed the back of her neck. I swear, the only thing we've talked about for weeks is Marquis Christopher and his entourage. Do you remember when life was simple, and we were working on your exhibit? Theodore smiled, nodding. We need a break from all this. One night to just be. You and me. Nicole smiled and nodded. A walk perhaps? They hadn't been seen together in public since she'd found out he was truly Peter Thompson. She felt like she was being hidden from the world, and she didn't much like it. It would be nice when she could be acknowledged as Prince Theodore's. Whatever she was to him. All of the detective work they'd put in seemed to have nothing to do with their relationship in any way. Their relationship had been put on the back burner, and while she had no desire to live in the limelight, it would be nice if he could acknowledge her. She giggled softly. She couldn't imagine her mother's face if she brought home Prince Theodore to a family dinner. Her mother had told her for as long as she could remember that she would marry Prince Theodore someday. Until she'd started school, she'd almost believed it. But when she'd gone to school, all of the other little girls had told her they were marrying either Prince James or Prince Theodore. After that, Nicole knew her mother's aspirations for her were rooted in fantasy. When all this is over, I need to take you home to meet my family, she said softly. Where do they live? In the countryside, not far from town. Mom would love meeting you. She always told me that you were my handsome prince and we'd end up married someday. Just like every other mother in the nation told their daughters. He shook his head, laughing softly. You have no idea how many women I've met over the years who have told me it's always been their dream to marry me. It's always felt a bit strange to be the center of attention for simply being born. If I could choose a persona to live as, it would certainly be as Peter Thompson, but my face is too known as Prince Theodore of Farron. Perhaps we need a walk tonight. We can forget all about our investigation and just be two people who think highly of one another. She'd started to say who were in love with each other, but thought better of it. She didn't want him to think she was trying to pressure him into more from their relationship when she still wasn't sure how she felt about it. This way then, he said, bowing regally. He waited for her to pass from the room and led her through the castle, to the back door, which led out into the lovely garden. Well, it was lovely most times of the year. Here in the fall, it was rather brown, all of the plants dormant until the spring. They walked through the quiet garden, hand in hand, just being. It was a relief for him to take off the mantle of the prince and just be a man in love with the woman beside him. I should show you my paintings of you. The ones I did before we ever met. It seemed like the girl in my paintings was telling me to come find her. Before she could reply, a figure lunged from the darkness, a blunt object arcing through the air with lethal intent. Theodore had barely enough time to register the threat before pain exploded at the back of his head, bright spots dancing before his eyes as he crumpled to the ground. Theodore. Nicole's voice pierced the fog of his faltering consciousness, laced with panic and dread. Then, all was silence. Asterisk. Theodore awoke to a world out of focus, his senses dulled by the throbbing in his skull. Gritty dirt pressed against his cheek, and he could taste blood on his tongue. 
He tried to move, but his muscles protested, memory unfolding in disjointed flashes, Nicole's alarmed cry, the swift descent into darkness. Nicole, he rasped, pushing himself up with a groan. She was gone, of that, he was certain. The emptiness beside him spoke volumes, and with it came a realization that chilled him to the bone. His greatest fear had come to pass. Kidnapped, he whispered to the uncaring night, the word slicing through the layers of his duty-bound existence. She had been targeted because of their mission and because of her closeness to the royal family. And now, Nicole, brilliant, steadfast Nicole, had become a pawn in a game much larger than either of them. Forgive me, he said to the stars. He should have been faster and should have anticipated the attack. The weight of his failure pressed down on him. Duty and loyalty warred within his chest as he struggled to his feet, casting a final glance at the spot where Nicole last stood. She meant so much to him, and he'd never told her. He should have been focused on her, not on his brother. I must find her, he said, his voice steadier now, infused with the resolve of a man who knew what he must do. There would be no rest, not until Nicole was safely returned and their enemies brought to justice. For now, he was alone, but not defeated. With every step he took toward help, toward rallying the forces of the palace against this unseen foe, he carried Nicole's spirit with him, a beacon of hope in the suffocating darkness. Theodore's fingers trembled as he plucked his mobile from the inner pocket of his jacket, the screen a cold, eerie glow in the night. His heart pounded against his ribcage, a drumbeat of dread and desperation. He dialed with a precision born from years of protocol and training, despite the chaos unraveling inside him. Metropolitan Police, answered a voice, crisp and detached. Inspector Lyle, please. It's Prince Theodore, he said, his words clipped, by urgency. Yes, your highness. Putting you through now. As the phone rang once more, Theodore paced beneath an ancient oak. The line clicked, and a familiar voice emerged from the static. Your Highness? What's happened? Nicole, she's been taken, Theodore began. He'd been working with the inspector on the plot to overthrow the kingdom. I'm in the back garden of the palace. I thought we were safe here. Oh no, the inspector breathed out. Stay where you are. We're on our way. Theodore closed the call, knowing the palace was next. The dial tone seemed to echo the pounding of his pulse, each ring a countdown to the confession of his failure. Royal household, a voice eventually answered, stoic and formal. King Albert, Theodore demanded, authority sharpening his tongue. The line hummed, then shifted as it was transferred. Son? What is it? Albert's voice cut through, concern immediately evident. Father, Theodore began, his resolve wavering for a moment, before stealing once again. Nicole has been abducted. There's been an attack. He recounted every detail, each observation he'd made during their walk, the suddenness of the assault, the glint of malice in the shadows. An attack? Theodore, Albert's voice broke off, laden with a gravity that spoke volumes of unvoiced fears. Father, I'm afraid this is only the beginning, Theodore interjected, his words etched with loyalty and duty. Whoever did this knew exactly when to strike, how to hit us where we're most vulnerable. His hand clenched around his phone. We've gotten too close to Marquis Christopher and his plot. Your safety is paramount, Theodore. You must come back to the palace at once. Nicole is still out there, he countered, his tone resolute. I cannot, I will not, abandon her to whatever fate these villains have concocted. Albert sighed. We shall deploy all necessary resources. We'll find her, Theodore. Thank you, father, Theodore replied. In the silence that followed the call, Theodore lifted his gaze to the heavens beseeching them for strength. Nicole's face danced behind his eyes, her laughter a bomb to his soul, her absence of void no title or privilege could fill. Be safe, Nicole, 
he whispered into the dark. The grand hall seemed to be filled with half the police precinct. Theodore joined them, immediately telling them everything he knew about the kidnapping. Your Highness, Detective Harris approached. We've dispatched units to all possible locations. Roadblocks are in place, and we're monitoring traffic cameras as we speak. Thank you, Theodore replied, his gaze never leaving the map sprawled across the table, dotted with markers that represented hope, desperation, and Nicole's potential whereabouts. What about her phone? Can it be tracked? We're on it, sir. But these criminals, they're savvy. They might have ditched it already, the detective admitted. Theodore's hand balled into a fist, the knuckles whitening with restrained fury. Then we must outsmart them. He could almost hear Nicole's voice chiding him for his stubbornness, her with a foil to his stoicism. Rest assured, we're doing everything we can, Harris reassured him. Everything seems insufficient when someone you care about is in danger, Theodore muttered. His mind raced with scenarios, each more harrowing than the last. The thought of Nicole, spirited and brave Nicole, at the mercy of cold-hearted abductors, sent shards of ice through his veins. If they hurt her, they wouldn't live to tell the tale. Sir, we should consider your safety as well, another officer interjected. Protecting Nicole is my priority, he stated, voice resonating with a conviction that left no room for argument. Understood, Your Highness. We'll coordinate with the Royal Guard and ensure your security during the search, Harris confirmed. As the officers dispersed to carry out their directives, Theodore's gaze returned to the sprawling map before him. He wanted to be at the forefront of the investigation, but he couldn't. Not at that moment. Nicole would never give up, he thought, his mind clinging to the image of her determined eyes, the curve of her smile even in adversity. Find her, he whispered, not as a command but as a prayer. He hated himself for the role he played in this, for it was his world, his birthright, that had ensnared her in its gilded cage. The royal doctor stepped into the room then, motioning for Theodore to sit on a chair. He sighed and did as he was told, knowing that the sooner his head injury was checked, the sooner he would be able to help find Nicole. I want to admit you, the doctor said. I think you may have a concussion. Theodore shook his head, ignoring the extra pain that brought. No, I must help find Nicole. The physician sighed. Sometimes, you need to think of yourself first. I'm glad this isn't one of them, Theodore said, getting back to his feet. The danger to Nicole was much graver than the danger to him. He wasn't about to lie around while he waited for news on the woman he loved. Your Highness? Harris's voice broke through his reverie. Lead the way, Detective, Theodore said, straightening his shoulders as he followed the man toward the fleet of vehicles waiting outside. Nicole, he promised under his breath, I will find you. The grand doors of Marquis Christopher's townhome yielded to the might of the police battering ram with an unceremonious crash that seemed almost sacrilegious in the stillness of the opulent neighborhood. Theodore, flanked by a squadron of officers, felt the pulse of his heart synchronize with each heavy footfall as they swept into the marble foyer. Clear. The call rang out from room to room, a chorus of confirmation that only deepened the pit in Theodore's stomach. He clutched the cold metal of the antique railing as he ascended the spiral staircase, his eyes scanning every shadow, every corner for a sign of her presence. Anything? His voice was barely above a whisper, strained with the effort of hope against reason. Nothing, sir, replied Harris, his tone clinical yet not without empathy. We've checked the upper floors. No signs of her. Nicole, he murmured, allowing himself a moment's indulgence, a memory of her wry smile as she teased him about his royal bearing. How hollow the jest felt now, how dearly he longed to hear it once more. Your Highness, Harris approached, his footsteps careful and measured, we should continue searching the grounds. Of course, Theodore managed, stealing himself as he followed the detective, back downstairs. His gaze lingered on the ornate pieces of art and the lavish decor, 
each a taunt to his desperation. Where could she be? Search the east wing again, Theodore commanded, trying to mask his trembling voice with authority. She has to be here. Understood. Harris signaled to his team, and they dispersed to do as ordered. As the search party moved like specters through the silent halls, Theodore's heart waged its war between duty and dread. How many times had he walked these rooms, blissfully unaware of the perils that lurked beneath the veneer of nobility? Damn it, he muttered, his hands curling into fists at his sides. Where are you, Nicole? He wandered into the library, the scent of aged leather and mahogany failing to offer any comfort. His father's words echoed in his mind, duty above all, Theodore. To protect and serve is the highest honor. Sir, an officer called from the doorway, the garden. It's clear. There's no sign of her. Keep looking, Theodore insisted. Every corner, every shadow. Your Highness. The officer bowed his head slightly before departing. Nicole, I will find you, he vowed silently. Chapter 11 Nicole's mind struggled to wake, her head pounding. The world was darkness and muffled sounds, the claustrophobic space around her suffocatingly close. A rag gagged her cries as she willed her thoughts to make sense. She struggled to free her wrists from the ropes that were tying them tightly together behind her back. The memory surged forth unbidden, Theodore crumpled like a puppet without strings. She could still hear the sickening thud of his body hitting the ground, the finality of it echoing in her skull. Think, Nicole, she scolded herself internally. You must think. Amidst the chaos of her thoughts, an echo of the past whispered. Once, she'd seen on a television show to kick out the tail lights if she was ever trapped in the trunk of a car, and she was certain that's where she found herself. If she could get a foot out there, then people would know she was trapped. There was also a good chance the car would be pulled over, for lack of tail lights. With a surge of determination, Nicole contorted her body, angling her legs toward the car's rear. Each kick was a plea, a silent scream, for salvation. The first blow, and she felt something shatter. Another kick, harder this time, and the light was no more. She prayed fervently that someone, anyone, would witness the breaking of the tail light. Come on, she coaxed herself, her breath short and frantic. Her heart beat wildly to the point it was almost painful. Someone must see. Someone must. The car hummed and rattled over uneven terrain, indifferent to the turmoil within its metal belly. Yet even as despair loomed, Nicole clung to her unwavering loyalty to Theodore. With every jolt and jerk of the vehicle, she kicked again and again, until her legs ached and her hope frayed at the edges. Please, she whispered through the fabric stifling her voice. Let this not be in vain. The incessant rumble of the car's engine ceased, jolting Nicole from her dreams of rescue. The trunk lid swung open, flooding her cramped prison with blinding daylight. Rough hands grabbed her, dragging her out into the chill of early morning. Her senses, already heightened by fear and adrenaline, registered the scent of dew-laden grass and the distant cawing of a crow. She blinked against the light, realizing only then that they were surrounded by the countryside. Move, grunted one of her captors, a silhouette against the sun. Nicole stumbled forward, her bound hands rendering her balance precarious. The farmhouse loomed ahead, its windows like unseeing eyes, its wooden facade a mask of serenity directly opposite of the fevered pounding of her heart. As she crossed the threshold, the musty scent of disuse hit her, a stark contrast to the crisp outside air. Upstairs, commanded the voice again, and she obeyed, each step a silent testament to her resolve. In her mind, Theodore's face emerged, his features wrought with the pain of betrayal, igniting a fierce determination within her. She had no idea if Theodore was dead or alive, but she vowed to endure this so she could get back to him. The room they thrust her into was sparse, the furniture minimal and aged. One of the men produced a knife, the blade glinting ominously, and for a heart-stopping moment, Nicole feared the worst. 
but then, he merely sawed through the ropes around her wrists, freeing her hands with a careless flick of his wrist. Stay here. Try anything funny, and it'll be the last thing you do, he said, his tone flat but threatening. The door slammed shut, and the click of the lock resounded like a gavel, sealing her fate. Nicole rubbed her sore wrists. She paced the perimeter of her cell, each measured step a quiet rebellion against her captor's expectations of docility. A surge of indignation rose within her. She was anything but a damsel in distress. She was Nicole, and she was strong. Think, Nicole, she muttered to herself. There has to be a way out of this. Her gaze flitted about the room, calculating and analyzing, but found nothing immediately useful. She settled on the edge of the bed, the mattress creaking under her weight. A tattered quilt lay folded at the foot, the colors faded over time. Patience, she breathed, closing her eyes briefly. Patience and opportunity. In the stillness of the locked room, Nicole's thoughts churned. She couldn't allow despair to take root, not when so much depended on her. With each passing second, her mind worked tirelessly, weaving and reweaving plans of escape. Nicole approached the window with hesitant steps. A soft breeze caressed her face as she peered through the dirt smudged glass, searching the landscape for a sliver of recognition. Green rolling hills stretched to the horizon, dotted with clusters of woodland and the occasional farmhouse. Come on, Nicole, she whispered to herself, her breath fogging the pain. There must be something, anything. But no landmark called out to her, no feature sparked a memory that could guide her home. The countryside held its secrets close, wrapped in the verdant embrace of nature. And there, standing at the window, Nicole felt a pang of isolation pierce her resolve. She pressed a hand against the cool glass, fingertips tracing the outline of distant trees. Think, Nicole, think. Her voice broke the silence, sharper than she intended. Theodore is counting on you. She turned away from the window, her heart heavy with the weight of duty. How could she devise a plan without knowing where she was? She needed a map, a sign, anything to orient herself in this pastoral prison. Phone, she muttered, reaching instinctively into her pocket. But her fingers met only fabric. Her phone was gone. The thieves had been thorough, stripping her of not only her freedom, but her lifeline to the outside world. Of course they took it, Nicole chided herself, a bitter laugh escaping her lips. They're criminals, not fools. Her mind raced, grasping at the edges of her situation, trying to find leverage in a room devoid of technology. Adapt, she reminded herself, her gaze lingering on the quilt once more. You must adapt. She scanned the room again, not for escape this time, but for anything that could serve as a makeshift tool. Her eyes settled on an old radiator beneath the window, its metal contours rusted but solid. It sparked an idea, a flicker of hope amidst the dread. Okay, Nicole said, steadying her voice. If I can't call out, maybe I can signal. Determination set her jaw, and she moved toward the radiator examining it for any loose parts. The room, though Spartan, was her current domain, and she would use every inch of it to her advantage. Help will come, she assured herself, the words a quiet oath in the stillness. I just have to be ready when it does. Nicole's limbs felt heavy as she moved toward the bed, a plain structure with a mattress that had seen better days. She lay down, an arm draped over her eyes, casting her into shadow. A single tear threatened to breach the dam of her composure, but she held it back, a silent rebellion against the futility of her tears. Would crying change my plight, she murmured to herself, words muffled by the crook of her elbow. No. Tears are pointless and help nothing. Her body was motionless, but inside, Nicole's mind waged war between despair and determination. This was not the time for sorrow. Instead, it was a time to strategize, to find a way out of her current predicament. That very loyalty now weighed like an anchor, 
dragging her spirits down into dark, unfathomable depths. Rest, Nicole, she commanded internally. Conserve your strength for the trials ahead. She acquiesced to her own counsel, allowing the rhythm of her breathing to slow, her heart rate to settle. Miss, are you all right? The voice cut through the haze of her slumber, sharp and alerting. Eyelids fluttering open, Nicole's gaze met the figure looming above her, a police officer, uniform crisp in the dim light of the room. His expression was stern yet not unkind, his posture professional but not threatening. Where? Her voice was hoarse with sleep and disuse, trailing off into confusion. Easy now, he said, extending a hand, cautiously, as though to reassure more than to assist. You're safe. Safe? Nicole echoed, sitting up. Am I? Truly? Yes, of course. The officer's tone remained even, betraying neither urgency nor complacency. You've been through an ordeal, but you're out of immediate danger now. Is that a promise, or a mere platitude? Her eyes searched his, seeking the truth, behind the badge, the sincerity, behind the stoic facade. That is my duty, he replied, meeting her gaze squarely. To protect and serve. Nicole nodded, taking a moment to register the implications. Relief began to seep into her weary bones, yet she could not fully relax. She had no idea if Theodore had been found and if he'd survived the blow to his head. Thank you, she said, her voice steadier now. I would be most grateful for your assistance in returning to. Let's take one step at a time, the officer interjected gently. For now, let's focus on getting you somewhere safe. We can discuss everything else once you're settled. Very well, Nicole conceded, though her mind raced ahead, plotting, planning, ever loyal to the cause that bound her to Theodore, to the future they had dared to envision together. The air was still, and the silence that draped the room felt oppressive. Nicole's eyelids fluttered open to a sliver of morning light piercing through curtains that hung like weary sentinels. She turned her head, noting the officer's somber silhouette against the windowpane. The once comforting blue of his uniform now seemed as cold and distant as the skies above Marquis Christopher's sprawling estate. Officer, she ventured, her voice a mere whisper, yet laced with a determined edge. I must insist. Take me back to Theodore. The man slowly shook his head, the movement punctuated with an undeniable finality. I'm sorry, but I have my orders. Nicole's heart sank as she observed his guarded expression. His eyes remained veiled, much like the countryside, beyond the window. In that terse shake of the head, she discerned the silent allegiance that screamed louder than any protestation. This man, this supposed guardian of peace, was nothing more than another chess piece in Marquis Christopher's elaborate game. Orders? Her brow furrowed. Whose orders? Not those that serve justice, surely. Please, he began, but Nicole cut him off with a swift raise of her hand. Say no more. She lay back on the bed, the linen cool beneath her fingertips, grounding her swirling thoughts. Her mind traced the contours of Theodore's face, the resolve etched into his features before chaos had claimed him. Had he anticipated betrayal of this sort? Loyalty, she mused, is not a virtue easily divined by the color of one's uniform or the badge upon one's chest. It is a currency traded in the shadows, where the light of truth rarely ventures. She turned her gaze toward the officer once more. You are bound by duty, as am I. But be warned, sir, loyalty bought by fear or favor is a fragile thing. He stood motionless, a statue bearing witness, to her plight. There was no comfort in his stance, no solace in his presence, only the stark reminder of the battle lines drawn. Miss, I understand your distress, he said, his voice betraying nothing more than professional detachment. But you must accept the situation as it stands. No, I will not. Nicole's retort was calm, yet it carried the weight of conviction. As he exited, locking the door with a click that echoed through her bones, Nicole wrapped her arms around herself. 
Loyalty and duty, those twin stars by which she navigated her life, now seemed blindingly distant. And yet, they burned all the brighter within her, defiant flames amid the encroaching darkness. Theodore, wherever you are, hold fast. For I am coming, and our cuz shall not be forsaken. Chapter 12 Theodore's fingers drummed a rhythm on the passenger door of Inspector Lyle's unmarked police car. Inspector Lyle maneuvered the car with a practiced hand, eyes scanning the sea of vehicles for any sign of Nicole. Keep an eye out, Theodore, the inspector murmured. She could be anywhere, but my gut tells me we're closing in. Nicole has always had a knack for slipping away unnoticed. Theodore's gaze was hawk-like, darting from street to alley. But this time, it's not by choice, is it? No, it's not, Lau replied, his tone grave. And we won't rest until we find her. As they passed Marquis Christopher's opulent residence, Theodore's attention snagged on something amiss, a glint of broken glass on the pavement. Stop the car, he commanded. Inspector Lyle obliged, bringing the vehicle to a halt. They both stepped out, their boots clicking in unison against the cobblestone drive. The Marquis's elegant car sat in the driveway, its usual perfection marred by a tail light that hung precariously, its red eye dimmed. Would you look at that, Theodore remarked, tilting his head to inspect the damage. He felt a mix of vindication and dread, this could be the clue they were waiting for. Curious, Lyle said, rubbing his chin thoughtfully. A man of his standing driving about with such an obvious flaw, it's unlike him. Too unlike him, Theodore agreed, feeling the puzzle pieces shifting, aligning into a semblance of sense. It's as if he wanted to be noticed, or, his voice trailed off, replaced by the gears turning in his mind. What game was the man playing? Perhaps it's time we pay our dear Marquis a visit, Lal suggested, his eyes flickering with a spark of suspicion. Let's not delay, then, Theodore replied. Together, they strode toward the grand house, wrapped in the cloak of duty, ready to confront whatever secrets lay within. Moments later, Theodore and Inspector Lyle stood before Marquis Christopher. Marquis, Lyle began, his voice steady and authoritative, we require access to your vehicle. A matter of urgency. Christopher raised an eyebrow, his lips curling into a sneer. On what grounds, he asked. Compliance would be in your best interest, Theodore told him. He watched as the Marquis weighed his options, the decision flickering behind his eyes. Very well, Christopher conceded with a dismissive wave of his hand. Follow me. They trailed after him, the click-clack of their shoes on the polished marble flooring a stark contrast to the hush that pervaded the home. Christopher led them to the car, where he fumbled slightly with the keys, a minor betrayal of his cool exterior. He unlocked the car, and watched as the two men looked all over the interior for something, anything, that would give them a clue to Nicole's whereabouts. Now the trunk, the inspector said. With a metallic groan, the trunk swung open, revealing its grim contents. Inspector Lyle didn't flinch as he leaned in, his experience eye discerning the dark stains on a blanket there. Is this blood? Theodore's query broke the silence, but his voice was stable, almost detached, his mind already churning with the implications. Impossible, Christopher retorted, yet he was unable to meet Theodore's gaze. Lyle donned gloves with practiced motions and collected samples with clinical precision. We'll have this analyzed immediately, he stated. Blood can be from anything, Christopher said, attempting to inject confidence into his tone, but Theodore caught the slight quaver, the Marquis's facade was cracking. It could be, but it's not, Lau responded, though his eyes spoke of different thoughts. Christopher was ushered away then, hands restrained not by irons, but by the invisible grip of accusation. As they led him to the waiting police car, he held his head high, denying everything with his silence. Is this justice for her? Theodore wondered inwardly, the image of Nicole's smile haunting him. The loyalty he bore her demanded action, and yet, doubt nodded him, were they ensnaring an innocent or unmasking a villain? 
Take him into custody, Lal ordered his men, his voice ringing with finality. Wait, Christopher called out. You have no proof. Proof will come, Lyle assured, unfazed by the Marquis's protestations. As the car with Christopher pulled away, Theodore exhaled, slowly. This was a move on the chessboard of Theron, one that played for the highest stakes. His thoughts turned to Nicole, her safety paramount above all else. The air was thick with uncertainty, and the scent of the manicured gardens seemed overpowered by the tension that hung between the men gathered there. He watched the carriage carrying Christopher disappear down the long drive, flanked by heavy-hearted oaks that had borne witness to both the rise and potential fall of the noble house. Inspector Lyle, a voice called from behind them. Theodore turned to see an older gentleman who he recognized immediately, the same man whose meetings with Christopher had concerned Nicole. Mr. Edmondson, Lyle greeted him with a cautious nod, his hand resting upon the hilt of his service weapon. May we speak privately? Mr. Edmondson requested. Of course, Lyle said, gesturing toward a secluded part of the garden. Prince Theodore, please join us. The trio moved away from the prying ears of the household staff, gathering underneath a sprawling willow whose leaves whispered secrets in the breeze. Inspector, I come to you not to save myself, but to shed light upon the darkness that has befallen us, Mr. Edmondson began, his hands trembling ever so slightly. Christopher, the Marquis is a desperate man, driven to the brink by his lavish indulgences. Explain, Lal commanded, the sharpness in his voice cutting through the soft rustle of the willow. His coffers are empty, his wealth, a mirage, Mr. Edmondson confessed, the weight of his words sinking into the soil like stones in still water. He sought to overthrow the monarchy, to instigate a coup that would place him in a position to profit from trade agreements promised by foreign powers hungry for our resources. Theodore felt a chill run through him despite the warmth of the afternoon sun. Betrayal of such magnitude was abhorrent, unthinkable. Bile rose in his throat at the thought of Nicole, somewhere held prisoner. Foreign powers? Overthrow? This is treason. Lyle's face was etched with the gravitas of the situation. And how do you fit into this, Mr. Edmondson? I was to be an advisor, a facilitator of sorts. But I swear to you, my only wish now is to prevent further bloodshed. The older man's gaze faltered. Blood has already been spilled, Theodore interjected, unable to contain the burgeoning rage within him. Nicole, her life hangs in the balance, because of this madness. Prince Theodore speaks the truth, Lyle added, his voice steady yet tinged with sorrow. You must provide all you know, Edmondson. It is your duty. Very well, Mr. Edmondson sighed, resigning himself to the role of informant. I shall tell you everything. As the older gentleman recounted the sordid details, Theodore's resolve hardened like steel tempered in the forge of adversity. He knew then that he would not rest until Nicole was free. Theodore stood by the window, his eyes scanning the throng of people amassed outside the precinct. The news of Marquis Christopher's arrest had spread like wildfire. One by one, they came, a procession of souls bound by a common thread of betrayal. Each tale was a variation on the same dark theme, Christopher's plot to usurp the throne for his own financial gain. Mr. Blackwood, a hesitant voice called out, slicing through the murmurs of the gathered crowd. Theodore turned to face a young man. I have information, the man declared with a tremor in his voice. Christopher approached me as well, promising wealth beyond measure if I were to align with his cause. Thank you for coming forward, Sir Hawthorne, Theodore replied, extending a hand in gratitude. His touch seemed to impart a silent encouragement, and soon others stepped forth, telling their tales of conspiracy. With each account, Theodore felt the weight of responsibility pressing upon him. He had no idea that the disloyalty to his family ran quite so deep. He had no idea about the future of the monarchy, but it felt like this didn't bode well. Inspector Lyle, he beckoned, motioning toward the far end of the room where a figure leaned heavily against the mahogany paneling. 
The inspector approached, his gait labored from the day's exertions. Theodore, what is it? Sir, there's a matter that requires our immediate attention. Theodore's gaze held a steely determination beneath the veneer of calm. Speak plainly, Lyle urged, sensing the gravity in Theodore's tone. I think that man knows more about Nicole's whereabouts than the rest of us, Theodore revealed, indicating a man seated in the corner, his uniform disheveled, his eyes haunted by the specter of recent events. Officer Beckwith, Lyle addressed the man, his voice brooking no dissent. We are aware of your involvement in this treasonous mess. We need you to tell us where Nicole is being held, and we need to know soon. Beckwith looked up, the pallor of his skin accentuated by the stark lighting overhead. She's hidden away, safe, for now, in an old farmhouse on the outskirts of the Fenwick estate. But time is of the essence. They plan to move her at nightfall. Can you take us there? Theodore interjected, his thoughts racing with the urgency of the moment. Why yes, the officer stammered, standing with a newfound sense of purpose. I'll lead the way. As they prepared to depart, Theodore took a moment to steel himself against the tumult of emotions surging within. Nicole's fate hung in the balance, and he could ill afford the luxury of doubt. With every fiber of his being, he vowed to bring her home. We need to be quick, Theodore said. We have to get her back. The pandemonium of the precinct was a stark contrast to the stately calm that typically pervaded its walls. Officers hustled past with grim determination, escorting a line of handcuffed individuals whose downcast eyes avoided the scrutiny of their captors. Among them were influential merchants and minor nobles, all linked by their association with Christopher's nefarious scheme. Please, I have information that could be crucial, one of the arrested whispered urgently to an officer, his voice trembling with the prospect of leniency. I can testify against the Marquis. Get in line, the officer replied. Seems everyone's singing the same tune today. Let's move out, Lal called over the din, his voice cutting clear across the room. Lead the way, Beckwith, Theodore prompted, his tone resolute as they followed the disgraced officer out into the chill of the evening air. Together with Inspector Lyle, Theodore got into one of the unmarked police cars and went to liberate Nicole. The road unfurled before them like a ribbon through the dusky countryside, leading them inexorably toward destiny's grasp. The old farmhouse loomed ahead, a spectral figure against the twilight sky. Its windows were dark its form hunched as if bearing the weight of untold secrets. They disembarked with quiet efficiency, the officers fanning out to surround the building. Nicole is in there, Beckwith said, pointing to an upper window where a faint light flickered. But you must be careful. They're likely armed. Understood, Lal nodded, motioning for his men to take position. Stay behind me, Prince Theodore. This is still a police matter. Of course, Theodore agreed, though every instinct screamed for him to lead the charge. But it would do the monarchy no good if they were to lose the second in line to the throne. With stealthy precision, the officers breached the entrance. Theodore's pulse quickened as he stepped into the gloom, his senses heightened to every creak of the aging floorboards. His eyes adjusted, taking in the musty expanse of the farmhouse's interior. Clear, came the call from the ground floor, the word echoing throughout the cavernous space. Upstairs, Lyle commanded, his voice low and certain. They ascended the staircase, the wood groaning beneath their collective weight. Nicole, Theodore whispered under his breath, a talisman against the dread that clawed at his chest. Clear. The second affirmation rang out just as they reached the top floor revealing a scene that halted Theodore in his tracks. There, they found Nicole, bound but unbroken, her head lifting as the door swung open. Nicole! Theodore exclaimed, rushing forward as the officers began to untie her. Thank God, she breathed, her voice laced with relief and disbelief. I knew you'd come. Always, he vowed, his words underscored by the fierce beating of his heart. Chapter 13
For being in captivity for the better part of 16 hours, Nicole was in good shape. She needed food and water, but other than that, her time with the kidnappers didn't seem to have hurt her. As soon as she was untied, she threw herself into Prince Theodore's arms, and he held her close. I'm so glad you're all right, he whispered. I was worried about you. I watched you go down after being hit over the head. What did he hit you with anyway? Inspector Lyle stepped forward. Did you see who hit the prince? Nicole nodded. Yes, of course. It was Marquis Christopher. I remember thinking I was surprised he was doing his own dirty work. The inspector nodded. He's been arrested, and many of his cohorts have as well. I have to say that I'm surprised just how deep this rebellion went. I have to wonder what he was offering others. Political favors mostly, Officer Beckwith said. He's made a lot of promises about what he'd do as soon as he was king. And what were you going to get out of it? Lyle asked. Head of the Royal Guard, Beckwith said, looking down at his feet. I was stupid to be turned so quickly. The man was obviously ashamed of his behavior through the events. Yes, you were, Nicole said, glaring at the man. When I first saw him, I thought he was there to rescue me. Don't worry. He'll spend some time behind bars, where I think he'll be rehabilitated to never do anything that stupid again, Lel said, shaking his head. You showed a lot of promise back with. Theodore, his posture impeccable even in the throes of exhaustion, sat quietly beside Nicole, who was drawn into herself, shell-shocked by recent terrors. Are you all right, Nicole? Theodore's voice broke the silence. She managed a nod, her fingers absently brushing the fabric of her dress, a nervous habit she'd had since childhood. I'll be fine, she whispered, her gaze lingering on the passing scenery, a picturesque blur of greenery and architecture. Theodore observed her profile, noting the strength it took to utter those words, the bravery that underpinned her quivering exterior. His heart ached with a mixture of admiration and guilt. It was his fault she was kidnapped. Your courage never ceases to amaze me, he said quietly, his hand inching closer to offer comfort, yet hesitating, unsure of his right to do so after all that had happened. Nicole turned to him, a flicker of a smile on her face. And your loyalty never fails to inspire me, Theodore. Even when. Even when peril shadows are every step, he finished for her, his tone firm, resolute. He reached out, capturing her trembling hand in his own. As the car drew up to the palace gates, they shared a look that carried the weight of their shared ordeal. The inspector, a silent guardian throughout the journey, opened the door with a respectful nod. We've arrived, Your Highness, Miss Nicole. Thank you, Inspector, Theodore replied. He extended his hand to Nicole, who accepted it as they left the car. Together, they ascended the palace steps. Yet, it was not the palace that loomed largest in their minds, but the fright of what may have been. Home, Nicole murmured. It may not be my home, but as a subject of this kingdom, the sight of the palace always makes me feel like I'm home. I can see that, Theodore responded, squeezing her hand ever so slightly as they passed through the towering doors. You are safe now, and that is all that matters. Whatever comes next, he promised as they made their way inside, we'll get through it. Were you hurt in any other way? I know I should have asked sooner, but I was afraid of the answer. She shook her head. I was hit on the head as you were. And I was tied up as you saw. My wrists are a bit sore, but I wasn't raped or anything. Just taken from you. I think Christopher took me because he knew I was looking into him. I don't know if it was the calls I made or simply that he saw us together, but he didn't like my meddling. Prince Theodore nodded, gripping the hand in his more tightly. It would be a long while before he would be able to let her out of his sight. Nicole nodded, her resolve steadying her once more. Now what? she asked. Now, we speak to my father. Nicole shook her head. You so calmly say your father, 
when we all know you're talking about the King of Farron. I don't think I'll ever get used to having you in my life. Theodore hesitated at the threshold of the palace's sprawling gardens, the brown withered plants of autumn a reflection of the turmoil that had only recently subsided. Nicole, her hand still resting lightly in his, followed him. I thought about suggesting a walk, Theodore said, his voice low, almost wistful. But I fear the garden's serenity may be lost on us, for a time. Nicole looked up at him, her eyes reflecting an understanding that went beyond words, a shared memory of danger that had marred even the most innocent of places. Let's wait until the flowers can just be flowers again, she replied. The corners of her lips curved upward in a small, brave smile. Agreed, he returned the smile, feeling the weight of recent events momentarily lift at her quiet smile. Instead, they turned, knowing they had to share what they knew with the king. With each step they took toward King Albert's study, Theodore felt the mantle of his royal duties settle upon his shoulders once more. His father's study was where so many laws had come into being. Pushing open the heavy oak door, Theodore led Nicole into the warm embrace of the room where his father, King Albert, and Prince James awaited. The walls were lined with shelves of leather-bound books, and the scent of aged wood and ink spoke of decisions made and the weight of the crown. Father, James, Theodore greeted, aware of Nicole curtsying beside him. King Albert rose, his expression one of relief and stern affection, while James's features softened considerably at the sight of them safe. Is everything, James started, but the question hung unfinished in the air. She's all right, Theodore said, offering a reassuring nod. He could see the tension ebb from James's posture, silent gratitude for the respite from further discourse on the day's harrowing events. Nicole stood by Theodore's side, willing to do anything to make certain all of the people involved in her kidnapping were caught and brought to justice. Your Majesty, she addressed the king with a respectful nod, her composure flawless, despite the ordeal she had endured. Nicole. King Albert acknowledged her with a gracious nod, the lines around his eyes softening. Your courage is as commendable as it is unsurprising. Thank you, sir, she replied, her voice steady, betraying none of the tumultuous emotions Theodore knew churned beneath her poised exterior. I don't know what all you've been told, father, but Marquis Christopher was at the heart of the rebellion the whole time. He was promising political favors to people who supported him. He'd made some allies in Alenia, promising them trade agreements. It seems at the bottom of it all is the fact that his family's money was drying up. So he thought staging a coup was the answer. James shook his head. To think, I once called him friend. This means Amanda and I are. You're safe to do what you want again, Theodore said softly. He was almost as thankful that James and Amanda were safe as he was that Nicole was. Almost. A small, grateful smile tugged at the corners of James's lips. He stood, extending a hand across the table, which Theodore grasped firmly, a gesture that spoke volumes. Thank you, brother, James said simply. I am so thankful that all of my family is out of danger. And you of course, Nicole. Then let us proceed with cautious optimism, Theodore suggested, addressing both his father and brother with a renewed sense of purpose. We will rebuild trust with those who seek amends and reforge our alliances. Yes, King Albert agreed, his voice resonant with the wisdom of his years. For in unity, we find our greatest strength, and in loyalty, the foundation of our legacy. As they left his father's office, Theodore walked with Nicole toward the back of the palace. I'm sure you'd like to go home and clean up, though I wish you'd stay here at least for a few days. He watched her, attentive to the slightest change in her composure, ready to brace against a tempest of reproach or a silent retreat. Nicole turned to face him fully, her expression inscrutable for a moment, before a measured smile graced her lips. I'm fine. It was a frightening situation, but it's over now. Thank heavens, Theodore said with a smile. I fear I've already failed to protect you once it cannot happen again. 
Your sense of duty is both your armor and your prison, she observed thoughtfully, stepping closer. The air between them seemed to thrum with the tension of their proximity, a dance of intimacy and decorum. But do not mistake my willingness to stand with you as a lack of awareness of the risks involved. A silence fell, charged with unsaid promises and unacknowledged yearnings. He found himself searching her features for clues to her innermost thoughts. Then, Nicole, will you still see me? His question hung in the balance. Despite all that's happened? They're an Independence Day, she said. November 1st. Come to lunch with my family. If you can sit at our humble table, share our bread, and laugh at my father's jests, then yes, I will continue to see you. There it was, an ultimatum lined with affection. To break bread with her kin was to step beyond the boundaries of their relationship as it had been and to acknowledge their bond. Lunch with your family, he repeated, allowing the full weight of her request to settle upon him. It was not a command performance nor a state dinner, it was an invitation to be part of something real. Very well, Theodore acquiesced, the corners of his mouth turning upward with a rare, genuine smile. I shall be honored to join you. Good, Nicole replied, a playful glint brightening her eyes. It's settled then. He offered his arm at the back door to the castle, leading down to the car he would take to drive her home. She slipped her hand into the crook of his elbow, and together they descended the palace steps, their steps synchronized in silent accord. As they walked toward the waiting car, Theodore felt the familiar weight of responsibility on his shoulders, an ever-present companion. Yet, there was something different now. His mind wandered to the upcoming lunch with Nicole's family, the thought of it sparked an unfamiliar excitement within him. Are you sure about this? Me at your family table? His question floated between them. Absolutely, Nicole replied, her grip tightening ever so slightly. You'll be a guest, Theodore, not the prince. Just a man breaking bread with those I hold dear. He marveled at her ability to separate the man from the mantle. It was a gift he found both humbling and intoxicating. I'm not certain I know how to be just a man anymore, he confessed. Then consider it another adventure, she teased gently, a soft chuckle escaping her lips. They reached the car, its black exterior gleaming under the touch of the setting sun. Theodore opened the door for her, and as she was about to settle into the seat, he paused, feeling the weight of the moment settle upon them. With an almost imperceptible nod, he closed the distance between them, enveloping her in an embrace that spoke of protection and promise. The world outside faded away as he held her close, the beat of her heart against his own a testament to the bond they shared. Home, then, Theodore murmured as he pulled back just enough to look into her eyes. Home, she echoed, the corner of her mouth lifting in a smile that reached deep into his soul. He closed the door behind her and signaled to the driver before taking his place beside her. The engine hummed to life, and the vehicle rolled forward, the guard in the front seat with the driver. His hand held hers tightly as they moved through the busy streets of the capital, and he said a silent prayer of thanks that she was all right. Chapter 14 Theodore stepped into the art gallery, his heart thrumming in his chest like the soft roll of distant thunder. He was not simply Theodore tonight. He was Peter Thompson, an enigmatic artist whose works had captured the imagination of the people. The gallery was filled with patrons admiring his creations. Each piece was a window to a soul he rarely let others see, but none knew the man behind the canvas. Nicole flitted from guest to guest, deftly playing the part of hostess. Her laughter beckoned Theodore closer, though he maintained his guise as a mere spectator. Isn't this one just amazing? Nicole gestured toward one of the paintings, her eyes bright with genuine appreciation. Peter Thompson truly has a way with colors. Indeed, Theodore responded, his voice steady, despite the flutter in his chest. It's as if he paints what the heart whispers when words fail. 
She turned to him, her gaze locking onto his for a fleeting moment, a moment that held the weight of all their unspoken words. That's beautifully put, she said, a tinge of curiosity lacing her tone. It's like you're an artist. In my way, he replied, a cryptic smile gracing his lips. We all are, aren't we? Creating moments and memories, that is art. True, Nicole mused, before being whisked away by another cluster of enthusiastic guests. Theodore admired her ease among them, how her presence seemed to elevate the very air around the artwork. They were all drawn to the mystery of the unseen Peter Thompson, yet here he was, invisible in plain sight. As he wandered, he listened to the quiet judgments and loud praises, nodding along to opinions offered freely to the stranger that was him. Theodore could feel the pull of expectation, the silent call of duty that threaded through the evening. These people sought connections to the world he poured onto canvas, but it was Nicole who anchored him, who provided the gravity he needed to remain grounded amidst the flight of his dreams. Your friend seems quite passionate about the work, a patron commented, nodding toward Nicole. One might think she knows Mr. Thompson personally. Perhaps she does, Theodore allowed himself to say. Or perhaps she simply understands the art. Either way, the patron chuckled, clinking glasses with him, she's a marvel. This show wouldn't be the same without her touch. Agreed, Theodore replied, his voice low, each word steeped in loyalty to the woman who unknowingly possessed his heart. She was more than a hostess. She was the muse behind the myth of Peter Thompson. His thoughts yearned to stray to the future, to the promise he hoped the night would hold, but he reined them in. There would be time for revelations after the last painting sold after the soft echo of applause faded into memory. For now, he was content to watch, to wait, and to marvel at the woman who made his art come alive. Theodore lingered near a cluster of patrons, their heads tilted in collective admiration of a particularly vibrant canvas. Remarkable, a woman cooed. It's as if he captured a dream and pinned it to the canvas. I suppose it is, Theodore agreed quietly. As conversations hummed around him, each sail felt like a chord struck on a distant piano, resonant, but oddly muted. He watched as another of his creations, a tempest of color and emotion, was claimed by an eager patron. Their excitement was palpable, yet Theodore felt adrift the reality of his success floating just out of reach. Isn't it something? A gentleman beside him marveled, gesturing broadly at the exhibition. To think these pieces were once just thoughts, now they're treasures. Artists often feel detached from their work once it's complete, Theodore mused aloud, his gaze never leaving Nicole as she gracefully navigated the sea of admirers. The true wonder is how it continues to live, to resonate with souls it has never met. Nicole spoke of the art with an intimacy that only he knew stemmed from late-night conversations and shared confidences between artist and muse. Are you close with Mr. Thompson? The gentleman inquired. Close enough to know that tonight is as much her triumph as his, Theodore replied. Her? The gentleman arched an eyebrow, his interest peaked. Every artist has a muse, Theodore said. Sometimes, she is the unseen hand guiding the brush. As the evening wound down, and the number of red stickers grew beneath framed dreams, Theodore's anticipation swelled. The gallery emptied slowly, the patrons departing with the receipts for their newfound treasures, ensuring that the art would be delivered as soon as the exhibit was over. He approached Nicole, whose eyes found him in the quiet aftermath. In his hand, the gift he'd brought her. Nicole, he said, there's something I've been meaning to give you. Theodore stood before her the painting concealed behind his back. Is everything all right? she asked, her eyes reflecting concern that transitioned into curiosity as she observed the odd angle of his arms. More than all right, he assured her. I have something for you. With a flourish, Theodore revealed the canvas, turning it to face her. The painting captured Nicole in a moment of contemplation, her gaze wistful, the colors interweaving to form a narrative both intimate and profound. It was the piece that had ignited his quest. 
Your talent never ceases to amaze me, she whispered, awestruck, by the portrait. His hands found hers, drawing them away from the canvas, to rest between his own. You are more than my muse, Nicole. You are my heart's compass, guiding me to shores I never knew I longed to explore. Theodore, or should I say, Peter. Her laugh was soft, a harmonic blend of joy and disbelief. Why did you keep this from me? I always meant to give it to you. I was just looking for the right time. His thumb caressed the back of her hand. I can't believe you painted this before you ever even saw me, she said. I never would have come looking for you if you hadn't kept emerging from my paintbrush, he said, gathering her close. I honestly knew that the woman in my paintings was destined to be part of my life. The best part of my life. I'm so glad you found me. She wrapped her arms around him and just stood in his embrace, enjoying the feeling of him against her. Are you ready to meet my parents tomorrow? I've never had more than one or two outings with the same woman, which is why the people think of me as the party prince. Meeting your parents will be a whole new experience for me. He was nervous, but he didn't want to come right out and say it. What if they didn't like him? My parents will love you, she said softly, understanding his concern. I sure hope so, he said as he leaned down and kissed her softly. As they parted, her eyes held the embers of their shared ardor. Remember, seven in the morning, she reminded him. We have to drive out to the country to eat with my parents. Seven it shall be, he affirmed, grinning at her. He knew the meal would be very different than what he was used to. There would be no fancy food, no servants, and certainly not a bit of opulence. He looked forward to it, even as he was nervous about it. She smiled at him. It's going to be wonderful. Until tomorrow, he whispered, pressing another quick kiss to her forehead, before reluctantly turning away. Each step back to the palace was a measured beat in the prelude to a symphony yet to unfold, their symphony, composed in the heart's own language and orchestrated by the hands of fate. Chapter 15 Nicole stood at the front door of the gallery, watching for Theodore. It was almost seven, and she'd never known the prince to be late for anything. A black sedan pulled up in front of the gallery, and she hurried to the back door, knowing there would be a driver and a guard going with them. Everything had to be safe for the king's son. Nicole, came the deep, resonant voice as Theodore got out of the car and opened the door for her. Prince Theodore, she responded with a playful tilt of her head, sliding into the back seat. I'm sorry we have to have guards, he said softly. Hopefully we'll be able to relax, precaution soon. It takes an hour you said? Theodore asked, settling into the back seat with her. Right around there, Nicole mused, buckling herself in as the engine hummed to life. Are you nervous about meeting my parents? Or excited? Both, I suppose, he admitted. Meeting your parents seems to open up possibilities for us. Yes, it really does, Nicole echoed. They know I'm bringing a gentleman, but they have no idea who. This is going to be fun. Theodore chuckled. I sure hope they support the monarchy. It would be awful if I walked in and they told me they were the brains behind Marquis Christopher, who has now had his title stripped, by the way. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? But no, my parents have always been adamant about supporting our monarchy, she replied. She couldn't think about his life and how he must always be longing to paint while he was out participating in his royal engagements. Are you still waiting to see how the day turns out before you tell me if I have a true chance with you? Theodore asked. I am, Nicole replied, her heart beating a touch faster at the notion. She said a silent prayer that her parents liked him as much as she did. Then I pray today is wonderful and your parents think of me as a long-lost son. I don't think it's my parents you need to worry about, she told him. Have I not mentioned my three older brothers? He raised an eyebrow. You don't think you should have brought up three brothers before now? She shrugged, a sneaky smile on her face. 
Okay, tell me about these three older brothers of yours. Nicole chuckled softly, her eyes gleaming mischievously. Well, she began. Let me start with my eldest brother, Ethan. He helps father with the farm. He's tall with broad shoulders, and he's wonderful with animals. When we were in school, he told a boy who was taking me to a dance he would skin him alive if he touched me. Nicole paused for a moment, grinning as she thought about her oldest brother. I've never seen anyone as good with animals as my oldest brother. Prince Theodore's eyes widened in admiration. Perhaps he can teach me something. I do enjoy writing when there's time. Nicole leaned back against the seat, grinning at the look on Theodore's face. She took a moment to gather her thoughts before she continued talking about her brothers. Second is my brother, Gabriel, Nicole said, her voice filled with mischief. He possesses the ability to tame even the wildest stallions. A hoarse whisperer, they say. His bond with these majestic creatures is something out of a legend. I know he sold some of his geldings to the castle. He hit a boy for asking me to date him. Said he wanted to get it over with. Prince Theodore leaned closer. They aren't going to like me, are they? He asked, not bothering to wait for an answer. Of course, they wouldn't like him. And your third brother? Nicole leaned back against the leather seat, her eyes sparkling with mischief. Alexander. He's more of a bookworm than the others. He does the books for the family farm, and he's tripled the family income in the five years since he took over. She smiled. If he doesn't like you, he won't threaten you. He's more devious than that. Prince Theodore's interest was piqued, his gaze fixed intently upon Nicole as she continued. But don't worry. I'm sure as soon as they see you're a prince of the land they hold dear, they will be as sweet as can be. I have a feeling it isn't going to be that easy, he said. She shrugged. You never know. Oh, trust me, I know. I have a younger sister, remember? True, but I'm sure you weren't one to get in fist fights in school. All three of my brothers were. Her lips curved into a playful smirk. Now I'm wondering why I agreed to this, he said, shaking his head. I suppose that's why you waited to tell me about your brothers until now. Nicole laughed softly. She truly couldn't wait to see the faces of her family members when they saw she'd brought one of the princes of Theron to their holiday meal. The car slowed, turning onto the gravel driveway that crunched beneath its weight, announcing their arrival. Nicole's childhood home stood sentinel against the twilight, its windows aglow with welcoming light. She smoothed her dress, an unconscious gesture as anticipation fluttered within her. Ready? Theodore asked, as the car came to a stop. His hand found hers, a reassuring anchor. Always, she responded, squeezing his hand before releasing it to open the door. They ascended the steps together, Nicole leading the way. The heavy oak door swung open before they could knock, revealing her father, a robust man whose presence filled the doorway. His eyes flickered with surprise as they settled on Theodore. Father, Nicole said, stepping forward. I'd like you to meet Theodore. Theodore, this is my father, George. Sir, Theodore greeted, extending his hand with the ease of a man accustomed to both power and politeness. Nicole hid a smile at her father's obvious surprise. Your Royal Highness, George bowed briefly. Welcome to our home, Theodore, her father said. Nicole told us she was bringing a gentleman friend, but we weren't expecting you. Theodore nodded slightly, a smile at his lips. She's always a surprise, isn't she? She is that, George said, embracing his daughter. She's the most remarkable woman I've ever met, Theodore admitted, with a smile. Is that so? Her father queried, a hint of pride in his deep-set eyes, as he looked at Nicole. Come in, then. Let's hear all about it. As they moved through the foyer, the familiar scent of polished wood and citrus tickled Nicole's senses, a comforting embrace of home. Yet, walking beside Theodore, 
She felt the subtle shift in her world, seeing it all through the eyes of a man accustomed to luxury. Upon entering the sunlit kitchen, awash with the aroma of rosemary and baked apples, Nicole felt a flutter of nerves as her mother turned from the stove. With her apron dusted in flour, Susan's warm, maternal presence had always been the heart of their family home. Nicole moved into her mother's embrace and just stood for a moment, before moving back to introduce Theodore. Her mother's eyes widened in astonishment, a wooden spoon held in the air as if she would fight off anyone who hurt her family with it. Mom, this is Theodore, Nicole said, a mischievous glint dancing in her eyes. Susan's spoon clattered to the floor, her hand flying to her mouth as she gasped, Prince Theodore? Disbelief laced her tone, an octave higher than usual. She immediately dropped into a curtsy. Your Highness. Theodore offered a wry, charming smile, inclining his head respectfully. At your service, Mrs. Winters, that's Nicole's last name. Nicole. Susan exclaimed, her voice a tangle of reprimand and awe. You didn't say you were bringing royalty. She shook her head at her daughter. Don't you think that would have been information I needed? I would have cleaned. Your home is beautiful, Theodore said quickly. I believe Nicole wanted my presence to be a surprise. Surprise doesn't quite cover it, her mother muttered under her breath, but her eyes shone with a mix of pride and overwhelming joy. She moved forward, embracing Theodore with the unconditional warmth reserved for family. Nicole watched, her heart swelling with an affectionate amusement. Her mother was just as surprised as Nicole had imagined she would be. The oak table in the dining room was set for the occasion. As they took their seats, Ethan, Gabriel, and Alexander, Nicole's older brothers, wore matching smirks, their eyes twinkling with mischief. So, our little sister snags a prince and thinks she can just slip him in at a holiday meal? Alexander teased, passing the basket of freshly baked rolls. Must have been one heck of a happily ever after pitch, Gabriel chimed in, serving himself a generous portion of glazed carrots. Please, Nicole retorted, rolling her eyes, you three could learn a thing or two about charm from Theodore. Is that so? Ethan raised an eyebrow, feigning a bow toward Theodore. We are in the presence of a master then. Nicole wanted the floor to swallow her up. She didn't mind that her brothers were teasing Theodore, but they should have at least given him a proper greeting before they started in on him. Theodore, unfazed, joined in the banter. I assure you, it's all about sincerity, he said, offering Nicole a supportive glance and a willingness to face dragons, both literal and metaphorical. Dragons, huh? Are Nicole's cooking not up to scratch? Alexander quipped, earning a playful swat from Nicole and laughter around the table. Actually, Theodore replied, his eyes locking with Nicole's in shared understanding, I have yet to try her culinary skills. He reached for her hand beneath the table. As the meal unfolded, the conversation ebbed and flowed with stories of childhood escapades and future aspirations. Throughout it all, Nicole felt a deepening sense of contentment. Here, in this house brimming with love and laughter, she envisioned a life where duty and devotion walked hand in hand, where every jest was a token of kinship, and every shared glance with Theodore promised a tomorrow filled with wonder. More wine, sir, her father offered. Please, Theodore accepted, his voice harmonious within the chorus of familial affection, but I insist, call me Theo. Steam rose from the turkey, now carved and distributed, with a flourish of her father's skilled hands. The trimmings were spread out like an artist's palette. So pleased to see Theodore fitting in with her brothers, Nicole felt a warmth run through her body. Pass the cranberry sauce, please, she requested, her voice carrying over the clink of cutlery on china plates. Here you go, Theodore said, handing her the bowl with an easy smile. He never once seemed out of place, even as he navigated the casual intimacy of this family setting. Nicole spooned the ruby-red concoction onto her plate, her thoughts drifting to the whirlwind their lives had become. 
You know, there was a time when I thought I would never experience something as simple and lovely as this dinner again. Her mother paused, a forkful of stuffing halfway to her lips. Nicole, darling, whatever do you mean? Ah, well, Nicole began, her gaze lingering on the golden skin of the turkey, remembering the cold fear that had gripped her during those harrowing hours. It's just that, after my little, adventure, moments like these seem all the more precious. Adventure? Her father echoed, the joviality in his eyes, replaced by a flicker of concern. Kidnapped, Dad. I was kidnapped. The words fell between them, stark against the backdrop of mealtime chatter. A collective inhale swept through the room. You were what? Ethan's knife clattered to his plate as he stared at his sister in disbelief. Kidnapped, yes, but obviously I'm here now, so all's well that ends well. She waved a hand dismissively, though her heart beat faster as she thought about her time in captivity. Obviously, Alexander murmured, the humor drained from his voice. Why didn't you tell us? Because it's over, and I didn't want anyone to worry unnecessarily. On cue, Nicole offered a reassuring smile. Theodore found me, and all is well. Unnecessarily. Her mother's exclamation was a mix of horror and indignation. Let's not make a fuss, Nicole implored, reaching for her glass of water. Theodore's hand found hers beneath the table once more. Nicole has shown remarkable strength throughout the ordeal, he interjected. Remarkable doesn't begin to cover it, her father muttered, still visibly shaken. The meal continued, albeit with a newfound sobriety. Laughter resurfaced in fits and starts, but the shadow of Nicole's revelation lingered. When dessert had been served and the conversation lulled into a comfortable hum, Theodore excused himself from the table. May I have a word, sir? he asked, standing beside Nicole's father. Of course, her father replied, curiosity edging his features as he followed Theodore into the living room. Inside the room, filled with comfortable furniture and a large screen television, Theodore took a deep breath. Sir, I've come to care deeply for your daughter, he began, his voice steady, despite the weight of his request. She embodies a spirit and courage that I admire greatly. With your permission, I'd like to ask for Nicole's hand in marriage. Her father regarded him, his gaze searching. You're serious about this? Very serious, Theodore affirmed. I want nothing more than to marry her and start a family. Can you promise me to keep her safe? Her father asked, the weight of paternal concern creasing his brow. Can you promise me that your life, your world, won't put her in harm's way? He was obviously shaken up that his daughter had been kidnapped and he was just now finding out. Life is unpredictable, sir, Theodore acknowledged, his own uncertainty a tight knot in his stomach. But I can promise to be her shield to the best of my ability. I will take her safety as seriously as I take my own father's. Her father's gaze remained locked on Theodore's, searching, assessing. You're not just any man, Theodore. You're a prince. With that comes power, yes, but also peril. I will protect her with every breath I take. She will have her own guards. The man behind her kidnapping has been taken into custody, and he has been stripped of his title. He will soon stand trial for what he did to Nicole and for his treasonous actions against my family. He will not harm her again. Your words are well chosen, Prince Theodore. Nicole's father turned away once more, resuming his pacing. But they're just that, words. My daughter is not a negotiation or a campaign strategy. She's flesh and blood. My flesh and blood. Of course, sir. Theodore's hand clenched at his side, his nails digging crescents into his palm. He needed to convey the depth of his commitment, to bridge the gap between intention and assurance. Perhaps, her father said slowly, pausing mid-stride, it's time I stop trying to protect her from everything. Perhaps it's time I trust her choice. He exhaled sharply. Nicole has made her decision, hasn't she? I hope she will. I have yet to ask her, 
Theodore said softly, feeling the air shift around them. Then, her father said, turning back to Theodore, a fragile smile touching his lips, you have my blessing. May you both find happiness and strength in each other. Thank you, sir, Theodore breathed, relief flooding through him. I am forever grateful for this honor. Take care of my daughter, Theodore, her father warned. Always, Theodore vowed, the promise a solemn oath that he intended to keep until his last breath.